so i hope it is uh, on track now uh, on behalf of the organizing committee i really pardon from you uh, due to our inaugural session is not being lived in the youtube but uh, as uh, the technical difficulty we are as we have promised that the from the first technical session it will be on so let's move on to the first technical session where uh, dr nirmal ludar gupta will uh, Uh, deliver his first lecture so let me introduce dr dash gupto uh, dr dash gupto completed his bsc and msc from university of calcutta and phd from biochemistry from the uh, national institute of cholera and enteric diseases nicet uh, icmr uh, and university of calcutta uh, he has been awarded several fellowships uh, like glen foundation for medical research post doctoral fellowship in aging research Uh, icmr senior research fellowship uh, university grants commission junior research fellowship several uh, research experience and employment are as follows he is now the post doctoral fellow and principal investigator at sanford barnham previous uh, medical Re discovery institute san diego california usa uh, and he was associated as i mentioned in the nicet icmr he is now working on the aging research he has uh, several uh, research peer reviewed publications in his name and with this brief introduction i now request dr dash gupto who is also the son of the soil uh, means uh, where our uh, college is situated he is also from belgoria so with this short introduction i will request dr dash gupto to deliver his first lecture over to you dr dash gupto okay thank you uh am i audible yes you are perfectly audible okay thank you uh thank you dr vadro for your kind uh words and i would like to thank you and other organizers for inviting me in this international uh webinar on covid 19 and it's really a great pleasure because as you told i am a son of soil so virabanguli is my parar college <laughs> and another reason for that because today i am sharing the virtual platform with my professor my teacher uh, who taught us the first uh, uh, virology in our msc classes uh, the keynote speaker of this webinar professor dhruvajyoti chattopadhyay it's a really a uh, surprise and great pleasure for me uh, honorable vice chancellor is uh, not present now so i would uh, address uh, other distinguished faculty members and vice principal uh, honorable keynote speaker and other uh, respected guests and my dear students uh, before i start i want to share my screen uh, dr vadra please uh, tell me that if my screen is visible or not is it visible dr vadra yes yes okay thank you uh because i am a first uh, i am the first speaker of this webinar so i you try to introduce uh, sars cov 2 and covid 19 i will touch uh, different aspects uh briefly i think that uh, next uh, speakers who will cover it more extensively and in depth uh so sars cov 2 is a novel coronavirus the name is severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 why it's 2 why not 1 i will come later and the disease caused by the sars cov 2 that is covid 19 that means coronavirus infected disease in 2019 so the name of the virus is sars cov 2 and the disease caused by sars cov 2 is covid 19 uh, i divided my talk in four segments that what is sars cov 2 and uh, where did it come from what is the general information known about uh, covid 19 and sars cov 2 and what are the different approaches uh, are being uh, developed for the vaccine and drugs so these are the four segments before entering into the coronavirus uh, because 
there are a lot of students who are uh, mostly from uh, physics background. I want to tell a few sentences about virus, that what is virus? The first question is that are viruses alive? Uh, we can't say it is uh, viruses are alive because virus uh, doesn't have any cell. It doesn't have any active metabolism. It doesn't uh, produce ATP. Uh, so we can't say virus is alive. Then can you say it's a non-living? But the argument should be that then virus somehow uh, it reproduce. So you can't say it's non-living. But for virus reproduction, it need a living host cell. Without a host cell, it can't replicate. Uh, so after a long debate, now there is a somehow there is a, uh, a consensus that it is an intermediate stage between the living and non-living. So what is the definition of virus? That viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. That means it needs some host cell to multiply. And what is the genetic material of uh, viruses? Uh, from uh, bacteria is a living organism. So from bacteria to human, the genetic material is DNA and it's double-stranded DNA. For virus, it can be DNA, it can be RNA, and it can be single strand and can be double stranded. You can uh, uh, follow my laser pointer. Uh, this is a double stranded DNA and this is the single stranded DNA. So virus can have double stranded DNA, double stranded RNA or single stranded DNA, single stranded RNA. So virus is an assembly of protein uh, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates. If you see that uh, this is the uh, genetic material of the viruses, and this is proteins, and most of the viruses, they have one lipid layer, which is called envelope, and few viruses, uh, which uh, do not have this lipid layer, they are called naked virus. You can see uh, several, uh, viruses, which is you heard about this, like uh, rabies, herpes, uh, pox virus, HIV, and this is the coronavirus. Uh, this is the deadly Ebola virus. Now coronavirus. Coronavirus ha has that uh, envelope. So it is an envelope virus and its genetic material is RNA, single-stranded RNA. So coronaviruses are a large uh, family of envelope single-stranded RNA virus. And it is divided in four groups, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, and the SARS, uh, uh, this SARS-CoV-2 and other uh, two viruses, what Professor Bashob Chaudhary told about, that's MARS and SARS, they are also in the beta coronavirus group. So the this SARS-CoV-2 is not the first uh, virus which caused that much uh, morbidity and mortality. It came uh, before uh, the coronavirus uh, outbreak happened before of that. Like in 2002, there's a first uh, outbreak uh, that is called that severe acute respiratory syndrome. That's why it's one. And the death rate is very high, like 10%. And then in 2013, it is uh, Middle East respiratory syndrome, MARS-CoV-2. The death rate is far higher than 36%. Though the infection uh, rate and spreading is less, so it uh, those didn't cause the pandemic, but for this uh, SARS-CoV-2, the spreading is very high, and so it uh, now uh, become the global pandemic. And you can see uh, today it's an, uh, more than 8.6 million people are infected, and for uh, 600 people died. So what is, uh, why we call it as a coronavirus? Because in 1968, uh, the scientists uh, looked under the scope, electron microscope, they found the uh, shape of this virus is like a solar corona. You can see today because today is a solar eclipse. So this is a, uh, like a crown, this solar corona, because of this uh, appearance, they named it as a coronavirus. Now we know that this uh, corona is actually the spike protein. Uh, and this spike protein is very important for virus 
because with this spike protein, they anchored with our SE2 receptor, which is angiotensin converting enzyme two. Uh, they anchored, they bind to the SE2 receptor and fuse with the host membrane and then enter to the cell. And after entering to our cell, uh, they use their own RNA polymerase to replicate their RNA. And using the host uh, machinery, they uh, produce their structural proteins and they assemble in our cell. And then a new virus is generated and it infect other neighboring cells. Now, uh, what's the origin of SARS-CoV-2? Uh, it is known that the bats are a reservoir of many deadly viruses. And uh, by the previous knowledge, people uh, know that the SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV both are originated from bat, where the, for SARS-CoV-1, the intermediate civet cat in Bengali that's called Bhambiral, and for MERS-CoV, it was camel. So uh, from bat through civet cat and camel, it infect human. So that's why uh, scientists first look at the genome sequence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the bat coronavirus. And they found that this is horseshoe bat. Uh, it is horseshoe because its uh, mouth is like a horseshoe. That's why it's called horseshoe bat. And uh, scientists found that the genome sequence of this SARS-CoV-2 is 96% similar with the horseshoe uh, bat coronavirus. So scientists conclude that, that it came from, it again came from the virus. The origin is uh, bat. Uh, and then what is the intermediate host? Then they found the pangolin coronavirus, the RBD of the pangolin coronavirus, RBD means the receptor binding domain, uh, the domain which uh, of spike protein, which is actually bind to the SE2 receptor that is highly similar, is 97% uh, similar with pangolin coronavirus. So then uh, scientists concluded that it actually came from, originated from bat and uh, pangolin was the intermediate host. From them, it came to human. Now, how do coronaviruses get into humans? Because in the Wuhan seafood market, uh, somehow these pangolins or other, maybe some other host, they are infected and they maintain this wet market is very unhygienically. And so it is uh, spreaded in the them and somehow who handle uh, this pangolin, he got, or he or she, I don't know, uh, that, that person got infected and who consumed that meat of pangolin, they got infected and that uh, the reason for this outbreak, that uh, outbreak started like this, to handling this meat, pangolin meat. Now the thing is that uh, if you see the paper in 2013, uh, seven years ago, they mentioned that, that this coronavirus infection will come again and it possibly escalate. And we are in that after seven years, we can see that the, it really it is escalate and it kill almost 500,000 people. And why is the reason? Because in the last, they also wrote that, that last hundred years, our population growth is so high that too much encroachment of the wildlife uh, habitat and deforestation. So if you look at this uh, left-hand figure, there is no intersection between the bat uh, territory and human territory. But now bat needs their uh, shelter, bat need, uh, bats need food. So they are also coming to human territory and human territory also increased and their domestic animal uh, territory that is also increased. So there is a large intersection of these three. So maybe the SARS-CoV-2 is not the uh, last. Maybe after a few years, we can see SARS-CoV-3. It is also possible. And uh, bat can carry uh, many deadly viruses. And like um, the Ebola, Nipah, Henra, SARS, all came from bat. Uh, and that is a very interesting question that how do bats carry so many deadly viruses? Uh, 
that is a, actually a different topic and can uh, be used as a several, uh, separate talk. So if you are interested, I will uh, give a talk in Ashutosh College on that. A date has not been fixed yet. That's my fault because I <laughs> didn't tell him uh, when I can deliver that because I, and I wrote one uh, article on that uh, in Desh Patrika in, uh, on 2nd uh, May 2020 edition. Uh, that is, uh, I wrote it, I tried to uh, uh, write it in very lucid manner for everyone. So if you are interested, you can uh, read that or you can attend that seminar. Now, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to demonize bats because bats are our friend, not our enemy. And uh, they are the natural pest control. They can consume million or millions of bugs at a night and they can help in pollinate plants and they disperse the seed so rainforest can grow. Uh, and bats, we can't say that bats are the only reservoir. We don't know which uh, wildlife is also reservoir some other deadly viruses. So we have to reduce deforestation. We have to uh, reduce our encroachment to their uh, habitat. That's why we can save us. Uh, demonizing bat is not the solution and killing the bat is not the solution. Now uh, I will go for COVID-19 timeline. Uh, COVID-19 uh, first case was reported on December 21st and then virus identified on January 7 within two weeks and the uh, genome sequence was available in Jan 10 in the, uh, for everyone. And in the end of uh, January, who declares a public health emergency of international concern and the disease was named uh, COVID-19 on uh, February 11 and March 11, who declares it as a pandemic. And now after more than three months, 8.6 million people are already infected and death is almost uh, now reaching 500,000. Uh, there is an interesting thing that from many corners, we are hearing from last six months that COVID-19 is nothing, it's just a flu. Even the president of America, he uh, tried to convince people that it's just a flu. So if we consider it really, it's just a flu. Uh, if we compare the seasonal flu and COVID-19, first we have to consider the R0 number. R0 number means how many people will be infected by an individual with this disease. Means if one person is infected, he can infect another 1.3%, that's for flu. But for COVID-19, it's 1.5 to 3.5. If you look at this uh, figure that if for seasonal flu, five people uh, is infected, then they can spread it 45 people after five cycles. But for COVID-19, if five uh, persons are infected after five cycles, 368 people are getting infected. And if you don't stop the spreading, uh, it can be a pandemic. Uh, you can, and it happened, you can see that uh, result. So our not number is very high for COVID-19. And if you compare the incubation time for flu, it can be one to four days. But for COVID-19, it is one to 14 days and maybe 21 days. Uh, I, I heard about that one month, uh, people are suffering from COVID-19. And because the hospitalization rate is tenfold higher than the uh, seasonal flu, so you need hospital bed and if uh, 14 days, someone is in the hospital. Other people can't get uh, the proper treatment. And it happened in New York and Italy that people uh, didn't have bed. The hospital system was collapsed and people died for that without treatment. And the fatality rate is 0.1% or less for uh, COVID-19. Now it's uh, the pandemic is going on. And because of the asymptomatic carrier, we don't know the, what is the actual rate, but it is estimated it's close to close to 1%. So uh, from this comparison, we can't say that the uh, COVID-19 is just a flu. It's not just a flu. We uh, should be more focused, should be more concerned about this uh, COVID-19. Now, if we think that how deadly is uh, SARS-CoV-2, if you look at the uh, x-axis, it is 
people infected by each sick person means uh, higher means the infectivity rate is higher and this y-axis is fatality rate. You can see the Ebola where the fatality rates are 50% uh, and the bird flu, smallpox, Spanish flu, the infectivity is very high, but the spreading was less. But if you see the measles, chicken pox, the mortality is very less, though they are highly contagious. We don't have a virus here. If we have a virus here, then uh, the maybe world population will be died within a few months. But it is not possible uh, because it is uh, against the virus evolution. Virus needs some host. If it kills the host, then it uh, can't uh, propagate and it can't multiply. So you can see the deadly viruses, infectivity of the deadly viruses is less. Now this uh, SARS-CoV-2, because uh, still the pandemic is going on, we don't know properly the number. You can see the region where it is in between of all. Like it is, uh, the spreading rate is uh, like 3.5 and the death rate is like a median of 1%. Uh, now, there is another controversy and conspiracy theory that it's a lab made. So I would tell that it is very difficult to make it lab, which is uh, all this property that which can spread uh, fast and also uh, kill many uh, patients. So to maintain this mid region, I don't think it's possible. So it's a scientist also uh, several times told, re, uh, wrote, that it's a, not a lab-made virus. It is. It has its natural origin. It came from bat through pangolin. It infected a uh, human. And now it's a human virus. There is a very interesting paper came last week that uh, it is a small population, but I think uh, it is very important to know because the, the epidemiologist estimation uh, is supported by this data. If you see that the uh, there is a cruise who, uh, which was going to Antarctica. Uh, they started their voyage on uh, mid in mid March, and there were this many passengers and crew, like 2027, and nobody had no symptoms on COVID-19. But after a few days, one patient uh, showed a symptom, and eventually, the 60 percent, 59 percent of the passengers and crew got infected with the COVID-19. And the surprisingly, this 81% of this 128 people are asymptomatic, which is always uh, being taught that the more are the asymptomatic than the symptomatic, the symptomatic. and 19% was symptomatic. And among this 19%, 6% uh, need hospitalization, 50% of them need ventilation, and one person died, that means almost one person. So this estimation, I think it's very close to the uh, estimation uh, uh, which are already discussed several times that 80% people are asymptomatic. So we don't know that who are asymptomatic. So we need to be careful because you can see, you can say that the death rate is very high in old people, but there is a 20% uh, overall hospitalization rate for younger people too. Uh, and if we don't have enough bed, that can be fatal because maybe you need some oxygen, but you can't give that oxygen. That's why a person can die. Now, uh, I will tell about the vaccines, what the different uh, approaches are uh, going on. Uh, most of the people, uh, most of the lab or industry, they tr are trying to develop a, a vaccine to use S protein as an antigen. And there are different approaches like RNA vaccine where the S protein RNA will be delivered, where it produces the S protein and uh, build the uh, immunity against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Similar like DNA vaccine where DNA, RNA and then protein. And uh, some groups they are trying to inject the recombinant protein vaccines, uh, the S protein, which uh, will develop the uh, adaptive immunity against the SARS-CoV-2. And this is uh, the famous because Oxford uh, vector vaccine, uh, the Chadox vaccine, 
the adenovirus, uh, which is a different uh, virus, which is a virulent strain. And they integrated the S protein uh, genome into that adenovirus. And they will inject this. And then after its infection, S protein will be generated and produce the adaptive immunity against the uh, SARS-CoV-2. And two straightforward approaches, inactivated vaccine and live attenuated vaccine. Inactivated vaccine means that uh, uh, producing the uh, SARS-CoV-2 in a, a laboratory uh, by in cell culture, and then inactivate it by chemical measure. For now, it is using the beta propiolactone uh, so that virus, uh, virus can't replicate in our cell, but it can give the immunity against SARS-CoV-2. And live attenuated vaccine is, it is a virulent strain that growing it uh, in the culture, uh, when uh, it become virulent, it become less uh, uh, weak, it become weak, then it can be used as the vaccine. So if you see that uh, there are 135 uh, clinical trial is going on and now 125 in the pre preclinical stage, uh, seven is pre phase one, seven are in phase two and two are in phase three. And uh, still now we don't have any approval for uh, the actual vaccine. So all this platform has their own advantages and disadvantages like for RNA vaccine and DNA vaccines, the production is very fast. It can be produced rapidly. But the thing is this platform is uh, not used uh, earlier. So we don't know the safety. So safety measures should be taken and that would take time for recombinant is vaccine. Uh, it is slow, but it is already established. It, it was used these approaches, but uh, for a global level production, we uh, it need time. For viral uh, vector-based vaccine, which is uh, uh, by Oxford University of Oxford and other uh, <clears throat> industry and institute, uh, that is also uh, some advantages of that, that it is not using any infectious virus, but it can happen that the virus actually uh, being used that can affect somehow the immunity uh, it is possible so we have to scientists have to look at, at that and there are two uh, straightforward approaches like live attenuated vaccine and inactivated vaccine uh, the pr problem with this is that we need time to make the virus when it become virulent so it will take time you are growing 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 and the you have to uh, take a lot of time for the uh, extensive safety measures and for inactivated vaccine the disadvantage is that you have to culture a lot of infectious virus particle uh, and that's the disadvantage of this uh, inactivated vaccine approach but both, both our approach are very straightforward and one thing i sh should mention that Serum Institute of India, uh, they are also trying to develop the uh, vaccine. They are using that live attenuated uh, vaccine approach. So it, it would be very good that if we have that vaccine from our own country for us, uh, it would be cheaper. Let's uh, hope for the best. And we should wish Serum Institute their success. Uh, now the drug targets. I would not mention the other drug targets because those are already failed. So it's a wastage of time to discuss about those. Uh, two drugs and two type of drugs now are in clinical trial. Uh, one is that TMPRSS2. This is the protein which facilitates the binding of AC2 receptor and S protein. It is a serine protease. So uh, the clinical trial is going on against this uh, protein, the inhibitors and maybe it will take i i uh, saw the clinical trial.gov.in uh, they are mentioning it will take two years from now to conclude and another is that the inhibitor of the rna dependent rna polymerase the viral rna polymerase uh, i i think that you all heard about that remdesivir the 
there are two clinical trials, but this result is confusing. One group, they reported that there is no advantage using remdesivir. Another group, they are uh, telling that it's a, uh, it reduces the hospitalization uh, period, like 14 days to 11 days. Uh, but I think we can't conclude right now. We have to uh, wait for more uh, number of the patients and the result. So these uh, two approaches are going on. Now you can ask that what are we doing? Means our institute. Uh, first, uh, I need to clarify that I am not in this group, uh, but I am presenting it as an institute uh, person, as an employee. Uh, you saw that the production of a vaccine could take 12 to 18 months or more because there is a phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Then you need license. You need to <clears throat> register it. Uh, for global production administration, it will take time. And for new, if you start from a new drug, you design a new drug, you synthesis that for safety efficacy, any new drug, they uh, usually require 10 to 17 years. So we can't wait for that. So what we are doing, we are repositioning the clinically evaluated drugs, means the drugs which are already FDA approved or it is using in uh, clinical trials or preclinical trials for other diseases. We are testing these uh, 13,000 drugs. We, are, we have already screened those drugs. What is the uh, approach that we infected the green monkey kidney cell, Vero E6 cell, with these uh, viruses? And we saw, this is called the cytopathic effect. If virus replicate within the cell, it kills the cells, which is called cytopathic effect. And we measure the cytopathic effect in presence of this compound, that if compound, this compound, uh, some of those inhibit the virus replication, cell would not die, it will be alive. So we measured the ATP of these uh, cells because ATP is the uh, marker of that cells are alive. And we screen uh, very fast these 30,000 compounds. And we found that 30 molecules uh, which have these antiviral activities against SARS-CoV-2 and force, uh, four of the, them are FDA approved. One drug is registered in Japan and 11 molecules have uh, in the preclinical stage and different clinical trial stage. And we also received 10 million grant support uh, from uh, government of USA for testing the broad spectrum antiviral to combat COVID-19. Though it was not, uh, this grant was not written for COVID-19, uh, they, the department uh, sent the, proposal earlier than the COVID, but now government is uh, telling us to uh, do the study for COVID-19. Now lockdown is over and we are uh, listening the term herd immunity. Herd means a large population of animals. That means herd. Uh, the concept of the herd immunity is that if a large population is infected or vaccinated. So they, the rest of the population is protected from this virus because the infected or vaccinated people, they stop the chain of the infection. So rest of the population is also protected. So virus is disappeared from the environment eventually. But uh, there is a new paper, according to their estimation, that you need at least 67% of people get infected. And uh, from the SARS-CoV-2, then you can establish the herd immunity. So where uh, we stand now, if you see that the New York City, a number of death and infection you heard about, but see, still it is only 20%, the infection. London, it is also 17%. Sweden, uh, the Sweden uh, was advocating for the herd immunity from the day one, but still in Stockholm, it's only 7.3% infection. And Wuhan, the epicenter of the SARS-CoV-2, still there is only 10% uh, people are infected. So we are far from the herd immunity. And if you consider the uh, stat, still only uh, from, for, Today's point of view, it is only 0.11% of the 
world population is infected. And if we need herd immunity, we have to uh, infect it's 5 billion people, which is we are far from that. So I would tell that herd immunity is very difficult for now. We don't have vaccine. We don't have any drug. So just take precautions, protect yourself and other from COVID-19 and clean your hands often, avoid close contacts, stay home if you are sick, cover cough and sneeze and wear face mask. Face mask will really help you to, uh, not only you, it will protect your other person from you. So everyone should use the mask and stay home. Uh, I know it's not possible because I have to also go to my institute, uh, but reduce the as possible as you can the our going outside. So that is all from me. Thank you. This is one of the building of um, our institute. I would like to thank again to the Devabruto and other organizers. And now I am ready to take the questions. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Uh, so if so, there if there is no uh, yeah, there Roto, I am uh, ready for any question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajgupta. Illuminating uh, uh, We can entertain the five, four, five questions because our next panelist is already on. Uh, so, from the Zoom, if anyone is interested, kindly unmute and question Dr. Dashgupta. And you can ask me in Bengali also. That is not one, of the, uh, one of our participants, Dr. Soidi Bista Sodikari. Yes. Dr. Dasgupta, am I audible to you? Yes. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Please go on. Uh, Dr. Shivoli Vishas Kudikari, he has uh, asked some question to you, sir. When will vaccine come, sir? When? Uh, when, according to... I, we do... Uh, we, I think it will take another at least one year to two years. And you know that uh, vaccine, most of the vaccine uh, is being failed at the phase three. So I hope that vaccine, this ACE protein, it will work and the virus uh, will not be mutated that much that this vaccine will not work, but it will st still take time. Uh, I think I know that many uh, that uh, co companies and the institute they are claiming that uh, they are uh, very soon they will uh, deliver the vaccine, but I don't think that's possible. Uh, I talk many people, the virologist and the vaccine uh, persons in our institute, so they they even uh, personally they are telling that maybe it will take three years. Uh, another uh, participant, Indonil Bhattacharya, uh, he has uh, he is asking a question to you, sir. You have said that we wear marks if you are sick. Uh, your voice is broken now. 
uh, the, uh, am i audible nirmaloda yeah yeah you are audible uh, so the next question is from sandi will hard immunity will work for india uh as i told that the you need at least 60% of the population getting infected or uh, getting vaccinated without vaccine without drug it will be very risky affair uh, because if 60% in population need to be infected the hospital uh, system will be collapsed and i don't know it's it's very tricky question and uh, we don't have any answer for that because now only still 0.11% people are infected so the next question is from rithik sarkar how much helpful are anti inflammatory drugs can it really help to reduce the load on the health system uh actually virus uh, doesn't kill us it is told our immune system uh, uh, kills us when the inflammation is too high so doctor use that immune suppressant like you know that um, bbc is now heavily uh, mentioning about that uh, dexamethasone which is not a new thing but they are claiming because it's uh, i think because of the research from uk so they are uh, uh, like it's a miraculous drug it's not a miraculous drug uh, people use uh, immune suppressant the steroid and il6 receptor inhibitors for treatment uh, but it is when the in uh, immune response is very high you need ventilation you need oxygen that time that if you are taking any immune suppressant it is not good for you because your uh, system your immune system will clear the viral load by your own immune system okay the so next there are many questions but we cannot under, entertain the silly yeah my my, uh, my professor and my sir will be there he can also answer <laughs> so the next question if a person have no symptom and covid positive what will we do with them uh, means asymptomatic yeah yeah uh, we don't know because even the asymptomatic patient uh, we don't know means like he already had the disease now if you are doing the qpcr you will not get the uh, virus you can't detect the virus but if you uh, detect the antibody uh, of igg or igm ig a uh, then you can tell that this person was infected and now he is immune probably he is immune we don't have any enough evidence that we can say that once infection that is uh, make you immune but uh, theoretically it would be okay the next question is from the geology professor of our college dr saurabh shom where does mm -hmm. corona virus stand in david baltimore's classification scheme of viruses uh i i really don't know my sir can tell this <laughs> uh, so the next question apart from maintaining hand hygiene what else can people do to protect themselves uh wear face mask because uh, initially who told us that face mask will not work but it is now uh reported for everywhere that uh, face mask will work uh you can see the report that in from italy that they, uh, some doctors they are claiming that this virus is different than uh, two months before but it is not like that uh, who is telling that because the viral load is less because of use of face mask uh, because the first inoculum of virus that is uh, will uh, define your disease if the viral load is less then your symptom will be less and it, it can be uh, cleared by your immune system so it will reduce your viral load and it will spreading will be lower so use face mask religiously and wash your hand and uh, when you are outside uh, avoid touch the surfaces because uh, sars cov 2 is uh, virulent on uh, and it can infect from the surfaces it's 3 days even 3 days it can survive on the surface so another tricky question in your presentation you told that this virus has come from bat and mongolian simultaneously you were telling bat is not our enemy so how is it possible bat is not our enemy because bat is a really integral part of our uh, environment and bat has the equal right uh, like all other organism have and as i mentioned that we know bat bats are reservoir but maybe some other reservoir also there the all other rodents we don't know 
and because we are encroaching their territory, they are nocturnal. Uh, there is a less possibility to contact with us, but because we encroach their land, that's why bat is coming. And from bat, it can be uh, transmitted to other uh, organ uh, animal like Hendra. It was infected horse from horse to uh, human. So it is a, always it will happen. We have to protect the wildlife and the habitats for animals. So many attendants have appreciated your presentation, very lucid manner. Oh, another, another, sorry, another uh, mention that as I told that bats are a natural uh, pest killer, which can save million of dollars for the pesticides and the uh, harmful effect of the pesticides. And it required for a bat really help for the pollination of the fruits like banana and mangoes. So bat is really beneficial for us. Okay. Next question, maybe technical, I don't know. Why is vaccine not made from polymerase genes because polymerase genes are less evolved with time? Uh, because uh, we have to look at the antigenicity and S protein has the highest antigenicity uh, for this SARS-CoV-2. Uh, scientists found that. That's why people are trying this S protein because it is uh, in the surface and it produced the highest a level of antigenicity and other structural protein, they also produce antigenicity, but it is less. So is there any kind of infection peak and how it can be evaluated? The time period? Uh, for asymptomatic, the virus shedding will be within as a median of two days, but for symptomatic uh, patient, it would be like 14 days, 21 days, and very critical uh, patients, it can be uh, prolonged for one month, the virus shedding. So is this overloading your question or I can continue? I don't no, know. I, I, am, I am fine. Um, I am fine. It's up to you. How can I differentiate between fever and pollen allergy related respiratory symptoms and COVID-19 infection? Uh, though it's a, I think, question for clinicians, but uh, I think that uh, for an allergy, uh, you have only that breathing problem, but we don't have other symptoms like uh, fever. I, I don't know personally, but I think so. And one interesting thing that today I read that actually who has the aller allergy, uh, prone to allergy, they have the SE2, the expression of the SE2 receptor that is actually less in their body. So they are less prone for the virus infection. Uh, so maybe uh, allergy uh, prone people are safe a little bit. I, I can't conclude it, but I read it in, in a paper. Okay, so the, sir, the death ratios are varying from one country to another. May I guess for the risk? May I, may I guess for the racial variety of human host or else the possible reason? Uh, it, 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 can, it can be uh, told in two ways. Like if you see the death rate is in Europe is very high, like Italy and uh, Spain, there's a like 10, more than 10%, 12%. Actually, uh, their system is too overwhelming. They uh, didn't test all people. They only tested the severe, uh, symptomatic people, that's why it is not actually 10%. And for racial thing, yes, uh, if you see the USA result, the more uh, the death rate and hospitalization rate in the blacks, in the Hispanics and the Asian, because they are poor, they don't have the medical insurances most of the time. And so they try to tolerate the disease as far they can. And when they are going to the hospital, then they, are in the very severe state. So that's why that economic uh, uh, thing is one of the uh, associated with this race type of thing. It's not that the, uh, any other physiological purpose, I don't think so. It is actually for the economic background. And because these, uh, if you uh, see the people here in USA, I can say that the black people, they have to come out for their work. They are janitors, they are drivers, so they are also, they can't maintain that much social distancing for their livelihood. So they are get infected 
and they don't have insurances. So that's the reason. So nowadays, if we find little fever, cold or throat sore, every test is now. Should we test for COVID or go for medicines for fever? Uh, I think that it's a question for a clinician. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe you have some symptoms and now because uh, you have to stay home and to watch and contact your physician. Like here it is also not possible. We have to video conference and then we have to tell the symptoms and then they recommended that we need a testing or not. Next, uh, maybe a dichotomy. There were some reports in newspapers regarding reverse zoonosis of the coronaviruses. Do these reports have any scientific basis? Uh, I also heard that. Uh, I don't know, but it is uh, uh, reported that from reverse zoonosis means uh, uh, the da dogs and cats, they are infected from human. They are uh, actually their owners. Mm. But uh, there's few reports. I don't think that's a very important thing. But uh, people told me that reverse genesis uh, also can happen. Okay, maybe a couple of questions can be taken, sir. Is there any chance to get reinfection with SARS-CoV-2 in an individual? Uh, if we consider the uh, first SARS, uh, it was reported that until two years, you have the protective uh, IgG in your uh, body. So you are, you should be protected if the same thing happened for SARS-CoV-2, but still we don't have any evidence for that. But personally, I believe theoretically you are protected at least uh, if it is not that much mutated, you are protected from the second infection. Otherwise our vaccine and these heart immunity all concept will be in vain. Dr. Bodro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where the coronavirus can be alive or not, and not alive? Uh, there is a long-term debate. Uh, the virus is a law, either is a living material or non-living, but now there is somehow there is a um, consensus that it is an intermediate virus. I mean, it's not for coronavirus, all viruses. Uh, they are intermediate between living and non-living. Because they doesn't, uh, they don't have any cell, they don't have any metabolism, they can't produce ATP. They can only multiply, but that multiplication also needs some host cell. They can't uh, do it their own. They use the host machinery for their multiplication. Can asymptomatic individuals infect others? WHO seems to be experiencing division of opinion about this. Yeah, they 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 uh, confuse uh, people. Uh, if it is in the first uh, few days, like uh, it is a median of their viral shedding is two, three days. In that time, they can infect, but you don't know when they are actually there, they have this, uh, have these viruses with them because it's asymptomatic. Maybe today you are not shedding, tomorrow you will uh, shed the viruses. So that is very difficult to say, to detect that who is asymptomatic and when uh, he is shedding the viruses to the environment. That's why you need mask. It is not protect uh, yourself, yeah. actually protect others. So enough questions are being entertained. So we have Dr. come. Dr. Dr. Uh, yes, Dr. Salam. I, I have one question, one or two questions. <laughs> yes, please. In case of uh, higher education institute like uh, college or universities, you know that there are uh, canteen facilities are there and common bathroom facilities are there also. So how the students or uh, faculty members should do the precautions and uh, the sanitization frequencies are required for that particular situation in the higher education institute? Uh, it is. It is reported that the although that uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, can be our intestine, but there is no report that it can be transmitted through our stool. So uh, that is one thing. And for personal hygiene, that if you touch something, you are you are carrying the virus and you are touching some surfaces. And uh, again, other people uh, touch that surface. So it can happen uh, that you are getting 
infected so wash your hand as much as you can and don't uh, uh, sanitization, uh, sanitization, mouth and... sanitization is required on a frequent basis sanitization and yeah sanitize all of the uh, surfaces that is also required using the bleach bleach can uh, destroy the virus particles using bleach that will help and do you think that uh, tree plantation is uh, reduces the chance of this infection uh, of uh, coronavirus in the ayurveda institute uh what is the basis of that i don't know uh, why are you asking that <laughs> tell me it's an interesting question though tree plantation tree plantation tree plantation in the institute area no i mean how how we, uh, tree plantation is very good thing i always encourage that but uh, uh, why, why are you asking means did you re read uh, something like that that tree plantation can help i don't know in another uh, literature i uh, was reading in a particular data there is uh, some questions uh, on that particular topic that uh, tree plantation may reduce the chance of the spread of infection through this virus i am not sure about that but yeah i always encourage <laughs> that concept that plant as as you can so another question do you suggest vitamin c and zinc to fight uh here people are suggesting and i can show this is the vitamin c i am taking i don't know uh, but it is reported that vitamin c uh, can increase your lung function and here doctor is recommending to take vitamin d and vitamin c so i am also taking vitamin d and vitamin c uh, and uh, for zinc uh, zinc is also known for other diseases that if you administer zinc it can induce uh, your boost your immune system though i have little doubt about that boosting immune system because in our immunology books i didn't read about that term the boosting it, is it a commercial term or really scientific term i have doubt uh, i don't know but yeah zinc used for other diseases to and it uh, uh, has been reported for good clinical outcome so maybe the last question today there is an article in the newspaper that antibody of covid 2 can be functional only for 2 3 months and the same person can be affected after that how far it is uh i didn't see the report uh, uh, if it so then it is really a problem because for sars cov 1 it was uh, igg was for 2 uh, years 720 days uh, if it is less than that it is unfortunate but i think that uh, if we have infected once it will generate the uh, our adaptive immune uh, system and it activate our b cell t cells so it can clear the virus because otherwise the why you should develop the vaccine same thing can happen for vaccines that vaccine so i think we should be hopeful for that when not with that much pessimist okay let me introduce you to our vice principal dr sunjit kumar dash hello dr uh, i would like thanks to sir with dr dash to conclude uh, the session with thanks giving to the speaker because we are uh thank you dr dashgupta for your lucid presentation and information shared with us um hope we will meet uh, will will you come here and uh, yeah, sure. thank you for coming to parar college as i told you <laughs> sir your voice uh, is broken i couldn't hear hello ah uh, now now you are ah uh, when you will come home i uh, will meet and apnar uh, parar college apnar nemonton roi thank you thank you thank you very much thank you for your presentation and congratulations for organizing this beautiful webinar friends thank you okay so dr dashgupto thank you very much once again for accepting our invitation Thank so you. The Very next session is from your sir. Our yeah, I am eager. Sir, <laughs> Dr. Jivojit Chattopadhyay. He will be joining us shortly. And I'm happy to introduce with you, with uh, sir. Join. Please ask sir to join.
Welcome, user. Greetings from Bhairav Ganguly College. Hello. Hello. Namaskar. Hi. Namaskar. Ah, Namaskar. Could you hear me? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, Sir, good morning and welcome to this uh, today's webinar. And uh, as a keynote speaker, we have we have concentrated us. That's our pleasure. And uh, may I request you to uh, continue uh, deliver your uh, keynote speech. And I'd like to uh, request the both to continue. So it is indeed a pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Chattopadhyay. Mr. Chattopadhyay is currently the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Sistan Nivedita University. He graduated from uh, Bachelor of Science from Presidency College and majored in Chemistry. He did his Master's from uh, Biochemistry in 1975 and completed his PhD from Department of Biochemistry at Bose Institute. Professor Chattopadhyay was the Dean Faculty of Science at the University of Calcutta from 2003 to 7 and was the pro vice chancellor of the university from 2008 till 2015. He was also the director at the Center for Research in Nanoscience and Nanotechnology at the university during 2007 to 2015. Uh, he was the BC Guo Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology and Department of Biotechnology and Biochemistry, University College of Science. Uh, he has received numerous awards, accolades, and distinctions in his career. He received the prestigious UNESCO IUMS MIRCENS SGM Fellowship at the University of Texas. He was also the Fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 2004 and Fellow of the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology in 2006. Dr. Chattopadhyay has lifetime members in various organizations and scientific associations. He has a teaching experience of more than 35 years and guided many PhD students. He has around 150 research papers and six book chapters in his credit in depth. And he has the age index of 34 and a very good citation index of above 3200. Uh, Professor Chattopadhyay is a scientist and academic par excellence. He has an established track record of highly innovative ideas and in research activity. So with this, I would like to uh, request Professor Chattopadhyay to deliver his keynote. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you, Dr. Bhadro, uh, Dr. Das, Dr. Salim, and other uh, participants over here, and definitely the IQAC. Uh, very uh, good uh, opportunity for me to be present in a lecture which started with one of my very good students, Nirmaldo. And when Nirmaldo showed his introduction slide, I find what else I'm going to tell. <laughs> so I said, Devabrato, what I'm going to say because he's covering most of the things what I plan to say. So let me try and move a little bit up uh, uh, a little bit out of what uh, Nirmalo uh, mentioned to you. So though I'm going to uh, show my slides, I should skip my most of the slides, all right? Now, uh, I really appreciate the uh, people over here, the faculty members, and particularly the Department of Physics for, uh, I, shall, I shall request you when I shall uh, go through the slides, okay? So um, uh, I, that is one of the most important things. 
Now, this is a picture of my first slide. You know, while the onset of COVID-19 has jolted the world vis-a-vis -vis our country, as well as it has been a continuous process of protecting its citizens and ensuring that essential items are available seamlessly, learning, as we all know, can never stop. And this COVID-19 lockdown actually given us a lot of different other opportunities. And one of the most important opportunity I got it, that after a long period of time, I could be able to go through large, large number of um, articles, large number of um, um, scientific uh, interactions. And all these things are possible because now we have the time to get and interact with many other people globally. So the whole world is now together. So any part of the world, we can actually connect and start discussing about it. If you look at this particular one, this particular first book, The Virus, it was a wonderful book. And I request all the participants who were here, if you could get a chance that if you can go through these books, The Virus, another book by Albert Marion, the very, very dreadful, the pandemic. And this particular book on Zika, Ebola, influenza, fatal uh, fevers, uh, more deadly war, and the vaccine race, all these particular books actually tells us that you know that what we are facing today, the world faced several times before, and really 100 years back when the Spanish flu was in our country, in the whole world, large number of people died globally. But at that time, one of the important difference from today's thing is this, that time, the mostly the developing and the poor nations got affected. The wealthy nations are not affected in such a big way. Whereas this time, what we could find, the wealthy nations got affected in a major way. So this is a difference, actually, if you look at the type of infection, what we could see right now in the United States, in Europe, in most of the developed country are actually exposed us that you may have a fantastic medical infrastructure, but still you cannot fight this minuscule virus particle. As mentioned by Nirmal already, the virus particle which we could not see under eye, under microscope, we need electron microscope to see it. And that is actually making all of us puzzled. So in that background, my presentation is this. And you know that the, in the middle, you can see a canvas ball. The canvas ball with the pins on it. So it is actually one of my uh, students, PhD student's son, who is eight years old. During this lockdown phase, at his home, he actually heard so much about the coronavirus, the corona coming out of that on his canvas ball, he actually did it. So all these things are innovation. All these things are creativity, which are very, very important. Next slide, please. And thereby, next slide. Next slide. So this is actually a cumulative confirmatory case. And if you look at, as I mentioned to you, that Western world, United States, South America, and also if you look at the Europe, is much more, the incidence rate is much, much higher than if you look at what else Africa, the other parts of our globe. So this is something which is different from the usual pandemics, what we could see with cholera, what we epidemic uh, cholera or malaria, TB and other diseases where this world gets affected, the other part not get affected. Next slide. And uh, if you look at from the next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. 
So you can see that if we look at the history of pandemics, that it goes on from this particular bubonic flu to the smallpox, then we have the flu, then we have this particular plague. And so, uh, Dr. Salam, it's okay? Yeah, so um, uh, the plague. And over here, you can see the death numbers and death toll also. And WHO for this coronavirus infection declared this particular term pandemic on March 11, 2020. So on March 11, 2020, we got this particular pandemic situation. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And the, um, if you look at this um, coronavirus, COVID-19 symptoms and others, already through everywhere you could come to know about it, but the primary symptoms are the fever, the runny nose, the dry cough, shortage of breath, fatigue, as well as a body ache. Now, today in the newspaper, you have seen that the pinky, pinkness in the eye is also something. And the coronavirus itself is associated with the conjunctivitis also earlier. But at that time, that is a different strain. And its transmission is terrible. The spread from person to person through sneezing or coughing. And the respiratory droplets, which contains a virus, can remain on surface even after the ill person is no longer there. Next slide. And in this particular case, when we looked at these common symptoms, there is loss of appetite also, loss of smell also. And in this particular uh, severe diseases, we find that there is difficulty in walking, confusion, bluish face, and then coughing up with blood, the kidney failure, and there is a decrease in the white blood cells. And then it has got a white high fever. But in many of the cases, we could see that there are asymptomatic patients also. So the features of the infection could be clinical features, could be divided into three phases. One is the stage one, the stage two, and the stage three. In the stage one is an early infection by the viral response phase. The stage two is a pulmonary level. The virus enters the lung and causing this particular pulmonary symptoms. And the third stage is the hyperinflammation phase where the people started its ultimate thing. But in general, what we could find that the mortality rate of this particular virus is much, much less than any other. Because here, the mortality rate on an average is around percent but the contagious rate is very high. Now, how actually when it goes into the lung cells, next slide, yes, yes, you are right. The lung cell, you can see the lung is made of the alveoli and this particular alveoli has on its membrane actually has got number of receptors, what we call as the AC2 receptor. And this AC2 receptor recognizes the virus spikes the spike protein on the virus surface, which protrudes out of the virus surface and which actually already discussed. Now, this particular case, if you start with the good alveoli, which is shown is uh, first uh, top, and then you can see there is infected one. You can see the virus particles inside. In the moderate one, there is fluid accumulation and the severe one, it is completely filled up with fluid and that's why the gas exchange, the balance, you know, the carbon dioxide oxygen exchange takes place there. And this is completely perturbed. Next. Next. Next slide. Um, and in general, what we could find that there are the organs which are affected. The major organ is the lungs, then the heart and the blood vessels. Then comes the brain the eyes, the nose, the various symptoms is we could see in certain patients and that's because of this um, particular symptoms in the intestine also. So because these are has well, less number of SA2 receptor. So here it is a secondary stage, we can get this type of infection. Next. 
So virus actually enters a body through the nose, mouth, or eyes. And when it goes inside our body, what happens? It attaches to the cells in the airway that produce a protein called AC2. And this AC2 interaction, the virus enters into the body, fuses its membrane, and then endosomes. The, there is a change in the pH, you know? The, the acidic pH helps in the uh, dissolution of the virus envelope and the RNA comes out. It's an RNA virus as mentioned by Neil Marlowe, and this RNA gets translated into the cellular cytoplasm. So that is actually the case when the infection is in progress. And for each infected cell, it can release millions of copies of the virus before the fi cell finally breaks down and dies. So these millions of viruses coming out, they infect the neighboring cells and it infects and goes on the infection. Now, in the meantime, what happens, our immune system, it releases antigen presenting cells or the APC, which helps to detect and identify the virus. And this ACP, this APC, antigen presenting cells, they engulf the virus and display the virus peptides, which allows other immune cells to recognize the virus too. So this is actually, I skip it because already mentioned by uh, our uh, Nirmallo. But this is another thing many of us don't know that this particular virus was first isolated as 29E by Dorothy Hamre, a virologist and infectious disease researchers at the University of Chicago in 1966. And June Almeida, working at Britain's uh, laboratory, he actually took the first picture in 1967. Next slide. <coughs> next slide. Next. Uh, next slide. So basically the virus which uh, uh, human coronavirus Next, Dr. Salam, next slide. So if we look at this particular virus, this is an important slide, though Nirmala mentioned about it, but I just want to uh, tell you about this, that this Wuhan virus, uh, its origin is from China. It has got its other uh, contemporaries, the MARS virus, which is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus in Saudi Arabia. The SARS-1, also in southern China, and the cold caused by coronaviruses also. There are 15 to 20 percent of our common cold. Actually, it is due to the coronavirus. So all these other coronaviruses are no, not so dangerous like this one coronavirus regarding the transmission. And this transmission is so heavy. As I mentioned to you, the cells, APC-presenting cells, they recognize the virus, and then this viral peptide is actually the one which helps us to protect ourselves from this virus infection. So as I mentioned to you regarding these four different types, you know, this Wuhan coronavirus is a one which is completely new and novel to us, so our immune cells are not ready to receive it. But if after APC presenting cells are being produced by our system, which was done by our immunity system, we can fight with it. But in many cases, if your immune system is not so strong or due to aging or other diseases, you can have some so that the system could not produce this APC presenting cells bearing antibodies, then they cannot fight with the virus. So the I got infection with the virus. I, my APC cells, they are actually help the viral peptide presentation. And these T helper cells, they attach onto the viral peptides and being flagged by the APCs. And then I activate the other immune cells called the B cells and the cytotoxic T cells. These B cells produce the antibodies that help prevent the virus from infecting cells.
And the cytotoxic T cells, they identify and destroy these particular infected cells. The long-lived memory B and T cells that recognize the virus can patrol the body for months or years, providing immunity to us. And that is one of the reasons of what we could find out that why we are actually getting asymptomatic also. So our immunity system fought with this initial virus infection and we are not allowing the virus to replicate in our body. But still in our system, we can have a very low level of virus. So the asymptomatic patients, if the virus load goes off, they become symptomatic. A little bit moderate numbers, they will moderately symptomatic. So they may also give rise to this particular infection. But in general, the asymptomatic patients are due to our immune system. Now this particular slide shows that how this ORF, the open reading frames, they are actually helping this particular production of the replicase proteins. And these replicase proteins are actually helping the virus to replicate inside the cells. And that's why it is very important to know about the subgenomic messenger RNAs produced by this particular virus particle. And you know, this RNA is actually, this messenger RNA is actually the one which is being. Now, this slide actually shows you this infection process, the one which I just mentioned. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, no, next, next. Yes. Now, SARS CoV 2 infection can spread faster. The reason for it spreading faster, it was found that this particular uh, spike protein, the spike protein is actually, there is an enzyme called Turin cell. The furin cuts the spike protein at S1, S2 site. And the spike protein then attached with the new host. In order to efficiently enter the cell, the spike protein still needs to be dependent on this enzyme TMPRSS2. This activation of TMPRSS2 is only possible if the spike protein has previously been actually uh, been clipped by furin. So this is actually how I'm showing it, that what happens to this pre-activated one into the cell. So now if there is any way, this particular um, uh, furin is present in various human organs. And because of this furin, where this particular cutting can be taken place, you can see this actually gives rise to the potential infection. But in certain uh, genotypes of human population, we found that this particular TMPRS2 is actually is very less. And if you have a less number of this, what we'll have, they are going to be resistant to cut it, and then there will be no infection for the procedure. So this may be one of the reasons. So immunity may be the first reason, the second reason of this, and the third reason what we could find, the AC2 protein numbers, these particular receptor numbers may be lower in certain cases for which Another protein is involved, which we call as the ACE1. Expression. And if you have higher ACE1, you have less ACE2. In that way, also, it can control. Now, you know that the diagnosis is there. Uh, Nirmal already mentioned about it. There are several different ways of diagnosis are there. The real-time based uh, RT pieces, these are all coming up in the newspapers also. And the other one is a rapid antibody test. But antibody will be there only to those particular people who has got its infection already, already combated with this particular uh, virus inside the system and produces the antibodies. So unless the antibody, and in general it was found that the IgG and IgM, it takes a little bit time, seven, eight days, and another 10 days to appear into our blood system and only then it will be positive for us. So antibody test is actually going to help the already infected patients, but the newly infected patients, we have to identify by this test. 
and thereby what we could find that testing is India is pretty good right now. Large number of people are being tested. Joe, compared to the other parts of the world, the test number is less, but still we are improving on our testing facility and every day it is coming up and up. But only concern to me is that the price of the testing, there should be a limitation. There are a number of scientists who came up with this particular thing. In our uh, state, GCC Biotech already produced. And for testing purpose, I don't understand why it will take rupees 3,500. Now, it may be 1,000 or 1,500, but it goes up and up and up. So the major challenges for testing and diagnosis is the number of test kits, the quality of the test kits, you know, Delhi University, Delhi IIT also come up with a very nice test kit. IAGB, they have actually come up with a very interesting name, Feluda, uh, as a test kit. All these are actually at the level of 500 rupees, but still they are not available at least. This is a Feluda, and uh, these are based on this particular FNKS editor, the CASPIS edited linked uniform detection test. Next. So this number of tests, if it prices goes down, it will definitely help. So if we look at the treatment of this particular COVID, uh, this uh, workflow, you can see this is a slide which explains the uh, treatment and under which particular condition we have to get it off. And also we could see that when it will give us an idea about the normal diagnostics and therapeutic, the negative PCR, the positive PCR for COVID and the different types of admission to the different hospitals. Next slide, please. Next slide. So people are trying to make a cure of this particular. But over here, I just want to mention that Rubindranath Tego, uh, or in general, our grandmother and others, we, we already heard that it is mentioned that uh, in case of the influenza or uh, systems like that, Similarly, Rabindranath Chokhed Bali in his uh, true Bihari mentioned that um, if you, it is better that instead of going to uh, for any sort of uh, uh, medical person, if you can prevent it, it is much better. So that's why I said prevention is better than cure, which Rabindranath in Chokhed Bali through Bihari mentioned already. So stay home, save lives, help stop coronavirus by doing these things. So the hand sanitizer, the wearing of the mask, and you can see that right now we are pretty aware of the fact, but still there are a number of people who are adamant and not wearing this, but you don't know that how many of them are asymptomatic. So please request everybody to wear the face mask and try actually to prevent this. And in only in that way, we can actually get out of this particular viral disorder. Next slide. Next slide. So in general, what we could find, the first human trial is actually done with the different vaccines. And there are different clinical phases. And three is one of the candidate at five in in code. INO4800, and the others are actually, as I mentioned at the last, the pathogen-specific APC, the antigen-presenting cells. Now, this um, LMP encapsulated mRNA vaccines encoding S protein by Moderna is actually very important. And I, and I, I'll try actually to mention that here, the number of physicists are actually helping to prepare some sort of nanoparticles. These nanoparticles will help to encapsulate this mRNA for actually delivering the vaccine so that the vaccine is not going to destroy. Nanomaterials are also being used, as I mentioned to you before, that don't touch anybody. Why? Because the surfaces may contain the sputum or the cough or the sneeze of another person, you don't know about it. And that particular thing could be prevented. And there are number of nano paints are actually started to be available, which you could put it on the surfaces. They will not allow these virus particles to actually 
uh, adhere to the surface. Recently from ISCS, uh, Shudip Chatterjee and other, other group, uh, Shudip Chatterjee is one of the research scholars over there, they actually reported about one of the material, which is very interesting because of this electrostatic repulsion between the negative charges on the viral surface and the nanoparticles negative charges, they repel each other and not allow this particular virus to adhere to any surface. So there are these particular type of things are going on. But there is an adenovirus type 5 vector also. Uh, but all these things are actually uh, based on the spike protein. There are uh, DNA detide vaccines, which also delivered by electroporation, where actually with the help of a difference in the volt, it is possible to transfer the DNA inside the cell and which codes for this S protein. And if you have in your body S protein already saturating the C2 receptor, then the new virus particle cannot get the scope. And it is very interesting that after this particular infection, within March, we could see the first crystal structure of this AC2 S protein interaction. This particular crystal structures are available. This is a first in um, uh, such case, where in such a short time, the crystal structures are available. So we could really thank the scientists, researchers for doing so much for this particular purpose. So in one hand, we have the doctors, the nurse, we, who are actually helping us to prevent, the, to get out of this particular disease. The scientists, researchers of different disciplines combining the work together they're coming up with different processes, starting from preparation of ventilators to nanopens to the medicals, to the encapsulation. It is possible actually to develop the new molecules, new drugs, how to deliver them. And the other one is definitely the police and other machinery, which are helping that people how to keep these people separate. I must thank the uh, also the um, people of journalism and communication who are playing very important role during this period of time, informing the people about the different stages of this particular, every day we are coming up with informations through them, which are not there. Now, so there are major vaccine projects over here. Uh, next slide, next slide is okay. Yeah, uh, the Moderna vaccine, which we are expecting very soon. And this is actually one what is already mentioned and uh, mentioned by the uh, Nirmal, so I shall not go through it. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. And over here, I just want to know, or I want to tell you that the other approaches what is being taken is a repurposing of existing drugs. You know, the drug development itself is a 10 years, 20 years project, and it's a cost a huge amount, but we cannot wait. So what was the other try the people are doing is that there are a number of drugs to the virus particles and uh, inhibiting their, uh, their activities and to see which are FDA approved already so, so that we can use those drugs, modify them, and use for the, our own purpose against this. And in that way, there are several drug particles being identified. And you know that it started with um, uh, one of the medicine we call hydroxychloroquine. Now this, it actually uh, increases the acid uh, pH of the endosomes. So if you remember that after the immediate infection, the endosome's acidification is involved with the RNA to get released. But if the acidification gets, the pH goes up, then this particular release is not going to be there, people thought. And they tried to have this medicine. Later on, we find that when it has been globally being applied and uh, at a lower dose, because a higher dose, it has got some side effects, uh, the efficacy is not so high. There is remdesivir also, which is coming up, but that only what happens, the result looks like that it delays the infection process by 30%. But there are many other RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitors which are coming up right now. Plavipovir as the one which is used as a flu, uh, against a uh, flu, was found to be a very potential drug. 
in certain cases, uh, prednisolone, the dexamethasone, and they are actually helping also for the terminal patients. So there are a number of drugs which we call it as a repurposing of existing drugs. Besides that, computational biology is helping in a very way to actually model this interaction and try to find out how to actually prevent this interaction so that the virus access to the receptors. Next slide. So the drug developments I mentioned to you. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, this lopinavir and this hydroxychloroquine I mentioned to you. Next. Next slide. Um, over here, I just mentioned to you another new one, which uh, just in the month of June came out, is a competing pair of human neutralizing antibodies, which actually been blocked the COVID-19 virus binding to its receptor. And there is another one, development of an inactivated vaccine candidate for SARS-CoV-2. These are, and uh, in the nature, another one came as cross-neutralization of SARS-CoV-2 by a human monoclonal antibody. All these three are very, very promising right now. So when you talk about the types of vaccines, it could be four vaccine or the inactivated, inactivated vaccine, which we, uh, is very uh, successful in case of polio, the salt, seven salts vaccine used for polio. The viral vector vaccines, it may be the replicating viral vector vaccine or maybe the non-replicating one. Uh, the nucleic acid vaccines, as I mentioned to you, it may be DNA RNA best or the nucleic acid vaccines, which are protein based. And this protein subunit based all the virus-like particles, these vaccines are all actually right now under the test. And there are almost 75 very promising candidates out of 100 and 23 actually reported, uh, but 75 was found to be very, very promising one. But one of this particular vaccine from Oxford, they said that they may be available to uh, the people uh, for the final phase uh, in the month of end of September. The vaccine companies in India is playing very important role. The Serum Institute already are involved in the uh, Wicked Vaccine Program. The other programs also, um, the um, Oxford group also with AstraZeneca. Over here, the Bharat Biotech is ready to prepare that in bulk amount. So Indian vaccine companies are already preparing themselves that once the vaccine will come, they will manufacture it in large number so that the Indian people can get it. Next, at least the Indian people can get it. Next slide. Yeah. So as I mentioned to you uh, that these are adaptive immunity and the innate immunity both plays very important role. And this innate immunity is a word which makes one population very, very, um, what I could say, the strong against this particular viral war, but the one having this immunity not so high are going to succumb to this and they have to take a lot of precaution. And the second thing, as I mentioned to you, the age, the age of the, in general, the Southeast Asia population is much less than the other parts of the country. In our country, the number of uh, people in the young age is very high. So that may be another reason why the infection is not so high. But I must congratulate that this particular lockdown at the initial stage when our medical infrastructure is completely not ready with it, played a very important role to slow down the process of infection. Now the people are aware of it. The lockdown is slowly moved out to unlock, but we have to see that people are aware, they are maintaining the social, uh, this physical distance, they are having the masks, they're taking the precautions with washing, uh, with the we can, we don't have to wait till the huge population because there is another theory of herd immunity where at least 70% of the population, once it gets infected, it will be known as herd immunity, which helps.
the uh, infection to control itself because virus itself is a non-living as mentioned by Ninmallu. It only gets into the living status when it gets a um, uh, person or a cell, living cell. But if it could not get the living cell, it will not have any effect on that. So this is one of the reason. But in India, if we have to look for herd immunity, I'm sure that will take care of 97 crores of our population at least to get this particular infection, which is very difficult for us to afford it. So adaptive immunity is a one which by which we have our production of the antibodies in our system. And there are also the interferons levels, which are also very important in this. But you know this pro-inflammatory results produced by cytokines, and then ultimately, when the inflammation, if you rem remember about the slide, where in the third phase there is inflammation, there is a cytokine storm, and only if we reach that particular stage, there is no other alternative, but probability of death will be much, much higher. Next. So these are the different types. Action. I shall not go through it. This is a very tactical one. Next slide. Next slide. And uh, this outcome of this pathological inflammation in peasants with COVID-19, as I mentioned to you, it act, uh, is very difficult when the cytokine storms takes place and the inflammation itself will be dangerous. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so in that case, the immune suppression has to be used. We have to decrease the immune reactions and immune suppressants can use it. And in certain cases, it's been found that the blood uh, thinners also helps. But in general, there is a whole in this plays an important role and, and now it is completely neg negated also. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, in general, what I could find that the possible contribution of the hyperactivated monocytes to coagulate in COVID-19 is one of the reasons why the blood thinner sometimes help. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, this is an overall picture what we have actually discussed so far in the disease management. And uh, disease management involves all these things. And I request everybody, this information, knowledge, data integration is continuously going on. Every day we are coming with new knowledge and so fast knowledge acquiring is only possible because this particular disease have been looked as a globalized disease where the whole globe is right now fighting with this virus, trying to come out. The other important things what I could find is a collaboration. There are a number of collaboration starts between different countries to actually fight for this virus. Third is, is the one where we understood that our mindset has to be changed. The mindset regarding what we learned so far, there is a possibility that we have to learn, unlearn those things. And if we unlearn those things, we can relearn also. So all these things are going to be very, very important to all of us. Next slide, please. So at the end, I must say that COVID stigma is the one which is the worst thing over here. Um, I came to know from a number of people that how stigmatized are there, how panicked the people are in an, in, an, in an area. At the very fast, you can see the nurse who are working for us, the community is not allowing them to enter that particular, uh, particular area where they live. The other thing is that, oh, that particular person has got uh, COVID-19. So how actually we could actually uh, make completely that person itself you have to be very understandable yes we are isolating to prevent the infection but we are going to help you don't worry your family there are racial stigma there are violence against health worker and also there are social stigma the affected individuals are facing social stigma all these are very very bad so we have to fight it out we have to be
individuals. Right now, we can see the other therapy, which is which we call as a plasma therapy, which is all, uh, where uh, we are still uh, trying to do that. There are so many COVID-19 cured patients. They're offering their plasma for the others. So we have to be kind to these affected individuals. We have to depend on the facts and not on the rumors. We have to spread awareness regarding do's and don'ts as endorsed by our health workers and government and providing the mental health care because the stress is another one which is going to affect in a huge way. So each one of us has to fight the stress and help others to fight the stress also. So all these things are, if we can carry on with it, because we don't know how long it will continue, maybe till the end of this year also, or uh, it will slow down a little bit, but still we learned a lot from this COVID-19 pandemic. And we have to keep our learning with us that this is a process of relearning. Next slide which is my last slide, is actually where I wanted to make mention about this whole thing regarding the stay safe and try to actually help the others stay home, stop coronavirus and stay positive. So huge thanks to all the participants, huge thanks to everybody and the COVID warriors who are working for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Living in Calcutta, who else can be the better person to address the gathering as keynote address? Thank you very much. So, as you know, uh, in the keynote session, there is no question answer, but sir has kindly consented to allow for some questions to entertain. Maybe a silly one for you. Can I go, sir? Yes. Perfect. Yes, yes, definitely. So the first question is, uh, why we not use prokaryotic translation inhibitors against COVID-19? Uh, you know that COVID-19 only after infecting the cells starts its activities. And what type of cells they're infecting? These are the eukaryotic cells. So in the eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic translation inhibitors are definitely not going to work their machineries are completely different. So a numerable, innumerable number of uh, thanks to you from the attendance. And Thank you. Uh, Devarbhuta, what I can tell you that if you could find a couple of questions together, you can send the email to me. I shall send the reply because I don't want to, because already you are late. And so I don't want to keep uh, your time to be actually uh, properly managed. I don't want to disrupt that. So send me the email. And Devarbhuta, I really want to thank you and uh, Dr. Salam for his help in my presentation of these slides. And uh, thanks all the participants for the wonderful expression you have given. Sir, one thing I must mention, you have a very good library behind you. Uh, yeah, this is my library room. Yeah, <laughs> home library. So I remember Professor Chattopadhyay has visited our college a couple of years back during his uh, convocation address in yes. our college. So we thank you and uh, such a comprehensive lecture. Uh, I think uh, there is any stones that are being untouched. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Chattopadhyay. So for the participants, sir has allowed you to. Uh, conclude that uh, if selected number of questions are being sent to his email, he would uh, consent it to uh, answer you back. So thank Absolutely. you very much. Uh, so thank, thank you. you. Salam thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nirmallo. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you. Nice to see you. So the nice session. <laughs> So the session of student-teacher duo is comes to an end. Uh, and for the next session of the participant, I request all the participants to log on to 3.30 when uh, Shumita Goshyami from Portugal will deliver her lecture on COVID-19. So that's all for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending the webinar.
with the help of the second uh, second youtube name you must mention that Oh, for the next session, you have to click the second YouTube session uh, when the uh, Zoom attendance as well as the YouTube sessions will be live uh, right at 3.30 today. Thank you very much. Thank you all the panelists and all the participants. On behalf of Bhairav Ganguly College, we welcome you all once again. And thank you for the nice introduction by Dr. Nirmalo Dashgupto and Professor Dhruva Jyoti Chattopadhyay. We thank you again and we... Uh, conclude the first session here. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you soon, sir. Thank you.